and DC, and we are another the movement and collaboration with Sankara family, and also with um, uh, a movement called the Pan-Africanism Movement. So thank you, everyone. So I would like to say a few things about uh, Sankara um, legacy, Sankara, our revolution of Burkina Faso, from 1983 to 1987. So I'm going, you know, I'm going to start by a discord from Thomas Sankara. Sankara said, those who exploit Africa are the same that exploit Europe. At that time, he was referring to Europe. Um, who can tell me uh, what can be the problem? the common problem that, uh, um, uh, I repeat, Sankara said, those who exploit Africa are the same that exploit Europe. We, people of Africa and people of Europe, we have a same, uh, we have a same common problem, the same common enemy. So we can tell you what can be that, you know, uh, what can be that the common enemy, the common problem. We can, we can tell me that in this room. Yeah, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was the, <laughs> that was the answer. He was referring to the imperialism system. He said that we, no matter where you live, Europe, Africa, you know, even here in the United States, we have the same common enemy, the imperialism system. Uh, you know, Burkina Faso has many other countries in West Africa has been colonized by French. Uh, except Ghana, you know, a country that uh, doing relatively, you know, a little better. And um, Sankara came in power in difficult times, lack of human basic need, hospital, school, infrastructure. Um, Sankara um, was uh, fighting for our dignity, fighting for um, um, our... Um, um, fighting for our uh, dignity, fighting for our uh, um, our people, for uh, for them to be able to decide, you know, what uh, what can be our future. So, um, the colonization has a serious uh, serious consequence on our. Uh, on our uh, on our people on our country, it destroy. Um, excuse me. Um, the, uh, I would say the colonization has a series of uh, um, um, consequences on our society. It has destroyed our civilization, our tradition, our norms and values. It took away our identity. Our society has been completely disorganized. Sankara came in power in difficult times, like I said at the beginning, you know, lot of, well, lot, lack of lot of basic need. Um, the colonists promised us to come back with help, and according to that, Sankara said we don't need help. We need a help that can help us, evil help in the future. So he was referring to what he called the positive help, uh, helping for, uh, you know, give you one dollar today and come back and, you know, uh, and um, uh, pick up two dollars. So he was referring to those kind of help. Uh, regarding to the culture, Sankara said uh, the most cheapest and the most dangerous uh, weapon to destroy uh, a country is to take away its culture. So that's why he was standing for um, um, our culture, our civilization, our norms and values what can, you know, like uh, our, uh, um, what make us Burkina Bay. The different government before Sankara fell to uh, put in place a red vision, a vision that can guide our society. So Sankara said we need to decolonize our mentality because he believed that, you know, colonialism has, you know, like I was saying, has a serious impact on our society. Sankara believe uh, in values such as patriotism, loyalty to your country, to your friend, self-determination, courage, integrity, hardworking. Those were the core value of Sankara's world revolutionary agenda. 
is a for uh, you know renaming the country name of Burkina Faso was uh, uh, participating in this effort to, um, uh, to identify ourselves and repair the damage caused by the colonization. The old name Otto Volta Sankara Shara doesn't have any meaning for us as a Burkina Bay because we don't even know what that name came from. A few months before uh, Sankara assassination, a journalist asked Sankara what can be his biggest achievement, his biggest accomplishment. And in response to that, Sankara said our biggest achievement, our biggest accomplishment is for being able to lead the people to once again believe in themselves, shape their own future, and take control of their own destiny. So in this world, you can see Sankara's whole revolutionary agenda, what he was you know, uh, standing for, what was the main idea before his whole political agenda. Despite the short term that Sankara, you know, um, been in power, he's been in power from 1983 to 1987, only four years. But Sankara remained the most popular political leader, not only in Burkina, but also for the rest of the entire continent. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to introduce um, um, Mr. Asha Shamar Machas. Shamar Machas is professor at City College in Alem. She teaches uh, a course title is uh, People of Africa. She also shares she is teaching violation of human rights. Professor Shamara, uh, you know, had the opportunity to meet um, um, Sankara in 1994, of October, a year in New York City, um, you know, during his address to the United Nations. Professor Shamara also, you know, invited us twice last year and this year. And um, Peter been there, he's been there also, I think, this year, and uh, he said uh, the discussion went very well. So, uh, Professor Shama, please. Bonsoir. Buenos dias. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Salama sana. Greetings. Um, it is an honor to be um, part of this panel, and um, and I'm so happy to once again be with you to commemorate, remember, and learn from the lessons of Thomas Sankara and the revolution he led. On Monday, I returned from Tanzania and um, I'm often there. And it's um, another place where they tried to have a rev African revolution to regain some of the many things lost by the colonial system. They were colonized by several different groups, the Omani, the Germans, and the British, and now mostly American company. But the saddest thing is, every time I go there, I can see bit by bit, they are taking away the gains that were made during the peri progressive period of Julius Nereri. For instance, he established free school, kindergarten through university. No more. Now only primary. Books, uniforms are no longer free. He established free, his government, I should say, established free clinics, hospitals, and so on. Also, that's no more. So these are things that we find in so many of the revolutions that were quoted by our host, Cuba, Grenada, and of course, Burkina Faso. It's really sad to think that simple things like these citizens cannot count upon and consequently in the places I'm most familiar with, Cuba, 
thank God it's still there as a beacon to all of us. Grenada had the same experience that I explained, mentioned happened in Tanzania. But it's really sad when that happens, families cannot afford to send all of their children to school. And guess what? The girls usually are not sent. And since there's no work, nothing like that, cost of living is sky high, even though they've discovered natural gas, you think it would have helped? No, it will help the international cooperation, but it does not help the local people. So it's really sad, a very poor country that now has natural gas, some that have oil, you think they would help? No, we're, we don't see it. They build roads to take it out. So what Thomas Sankara and the Bokanabe people were trying to do was great for their people, obviously, but not for their exploiters and those surrounding them. How would the people of Cote d'Ivoire, for example, feel to see that the poorer country of Burkina Faso was able to establish free schools, clinics, and things like that, give power to women, etc., and they didn't have it, and they were much richer. Other exploitative countries in the region feel. So we don't only have to worry about our own corrupt oppositions that only want to be in power and to get richer and richer, but also those surrounding us and also the international elite. So Thomas Sankara was probably seen as an angel, a dream come true for his people and other exploited people and others who, con who are concerned about such people. But to those who benefit from our exploitation, he was a threat, a danger, a devil who had to be contained. What was it, 1992? Mm -hmm. When he came to the UN, my former director of African Studies, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, happened to be at the UN that day. So he came the next day, Tuesday, and he said, um, I met a remarkable person at the UN, the head of Burkina Faso, and I've invited him to come and speak to us on Thursday, and he consented. So we are having special lunch. He will talk to us. You can ask questions. Make sure you've done your homework and ask good questions. So he did come. But of course, when a head of state comes, they have to come with a um, uh, secret service. Then all Euro-Americans with blue suits and a little button. <laughs> and he, like Malcolm X and like, um, who is the other person? Oh, Morris Bishop from Grenada. They all said, I know we are here speaking to both enemies and friends. <laughs> and I'm sure they were right. And. Uh, and not all of the enemies were in those blue suits. There are many others that look just like all of us as they still do. So, but he spoke and he was so remarkable. He was so simple. He was so clear. He answered questions directly. And, you know, everybody just left. Students and faculty and a few community persons present, they left inspired feeling, oh, there's a future for Africa. Africa's not going to remain like this. This is a young, dynamic, uh, non-corruptible leader that we don't think they, they can buy off. We have hope. And everyone felt so inspired. It was really such a positive feeling. And we were all very sad when, because of time, he had to leave. So that was a great opportunity for us. And uh, it really made us think and question, you know, what should a leader be? What is supposed to be a leader? Is a lead he was not, um, you know, not, I don't know, he was just someone you felt you could sit down on the floor and talk to. You could talk to anywhere. And um, 
in that respect, he remind, reminded me of Fidel, reminded me of Morris Bishop from Grenada, reminded me of many such persons. And I've heard that Malcolm X also, I had met him. In fact, I had lived on Malcolm X's block in East Elmhurst, Queens, but I was a, a junior high student. And uh, he was, but we saw him and he was very inspirational. He talked to all the kids on the block, but, uh, and we went to hear him speak, but we never talked to him directly about politics. Uh, at least I had never been in such a group, but his manner was the same. So it's really important for us to see that such people do exist because they make us think that they're either crazy um, you know, or just not real. And in fact, I had a student in my class this year. For, for the last two years, the group has come from this wonderful center to speak in my class about Thomas Sankara. And this year, I didn't even know that one of the many students in the class a Bokanavi young lady born after the revolution. She didn't know anything about it except she had been heard it was better under Campari and, and if she ever meets anyone from Burkina Faso don't say anything about politics whatsoever. Just greet them respectfully because if not it may be trouble for us meaning her family. So uh, still she did join the panel and she was uh, very, she's interested. She just had not been exposed or told anything really about the revolution. So I'm going to give her one of the books about Thomas Sankara and his speeches about women in particular. And um, hopefully, um, I'm sure she'll read it because she's very interested. So I myself had never seen the book. I had seen Thomas Sankara speaks, but I had not seen the other one women's liberation and the African freedom struggle. And so it's a remarkable book. And I really, really thank Pathfinder Press for first of all, recording and these materials for us and others who may not have ever been exposed to it so that it's not lost. We can learn from it and grow with it. It is absolutely a remarkable book any page you open it to, you're shocked by what you find. You could quote from any page. No, seriously. And deep things that are said in a very simple, clear way to show how the women's liberation and equality and freedom is, of course, impossible without the general liberation of society. And it shows that it's not a conflict, as sometimes it's presented as if it should be, but that one, they come together, they must come together. It shows how in the short time of the revolution, one third of the, um, what did they call the provinces, were head, uh, became headed by women, one third in an African country. Let me know if there's any other in Africa or elsewhere, certainly not in this country. So it's and not only headed by women. Thomas Sankara says women have to demand what they want. They have to demand their, their needs, and they have to mobilize and together with others work to get them. We cannot tell them what is best for them nor can we do it all for them, but we can work with them. So it was just, uh, the book is, is, um, is, is a beauty to read. You don't want to put it down. You can't believe, well, would the next page be as good as this page? Yes, it is. So I refer you to the 102183 political orientation speech by the National Council of the Revolution, which indicated that early, the, uh, the firm commitment to work, to mobilize, organize, and unify all segments of the population, especially women, particularly women. And they also say, for the emancipation of women to be obtained, 
Freedom is not granted. It is conquered for they themselves, for and by they themselves, to put forward and necessary for them to put forward their demands and mobilize to win their demands. The democratic and popular revolution will create conditions to allow the total fulfillment for women and other oppressed groups only if imperialism is eliminated. Imperialism must be eliminated in order for the exploitation of women or others, other exploited groups, to be overcome. So I'd just like to end that by referring you. Please do make sure before you leave, you get Women's Liberation on the, on the African Freedom Struggle by Thomas Sankara. It sounds like it could be written yesterday, and it should have been written four years before because this is an ongoing struggle around the world. I went to school in India and also in Tanzania. And same struggle, same struggle. Different groups are more exploited than others in different regions, but it's one struggle. And we need to work together regardless of our various differences because we have much more in common and following the lead direction and words of people like Sankara, Fidel, Morris Bishop, and many others, we will win. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Uh, just uh, to add a uh, little things, you know, the revolution in Burkina Faso has been inspired by uh, many other revolutions, including most importantly by the Cuban Revolution. And as she was saying about women, Sankara was the defender of the cause of women, women liberation. You know, in our society at that time, women had a specific role in the society. And it used to be a time where, you know, people don't even send their girl to school. They said that they need to stay home, help doing the, you know, uh, cooking or, you know, uh, taking care of the house. So a lot of people at that time, you know, uh, do not want to send their girl to school. And when Sankara came in power, he said, no, women have to take the place they deserve in our society. We cannot reach the development and leave behind, you know, women and girls you know, who by the way represent a big portion of our population. So thank you so much for the detail. Uh, now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Peter. Peter is a member of the Socialist Working Party. Uh, always introduce Peter as uh, uh, a citizen of Burkina Faso because, uh, <laughs> because of his engagement, because of, you know, uh, we have been working together for a very long time, whether in New York or in D.C. So uh, whether, you know, conference like that or a uh, cultural activity. So um, Peter, please. Well, I want to thank Manolo and the People's Forum for having this opportunity to speak. Um, I know Manolo has been pushing me for a long time to do this. Um, and I'm glad we finally have a chance. And I want to thank Aruna and Professor Samad from, for joining me uh, and sharing some of the uh, work that we have here today. And I'm sure they'll help add to the discussion that we want to ha all have after uh, our presentations. Um, as many of you know, the entire continent of Africa has been roiled in tur turmoil for some time now. Um, I just arbitrarily say going back to 2014. That's when Burkina Faso rose up and drove out the murderer, dictator, Compore. Um, but since then, too, all around the continent, 
uh, people have been rising up, protesting, pressing for political space. Uh, just recently, Algeria, millions of people in the streets. Before that, Ethiopia, a country of 100 million people, massive protests changing the face of Africa. Togo, Chad, the Congo, other places, um, and that. And Africa is a very different continent today than it was at the time of Thomas Sankara. The fundamental problems have not changed, but the, if you look at it, the overwhelming populations of some of these countries, are, the age of under 25 is the majority of the population. So pressing for change and hope and wanting something different um, is, is a big thing. Um, now, we know from uh, the experience in Burkina Faso and um, that in 2014 they got rid of Com Compore, but, and I know I was discussing this with my friends at the time, and they said, okay, now we can go back to school, go back to work, we've solved all our problems, <coughs> and we'll now have constitutional government. But very soon, the reality started to set in that a face may have changed, but the regime was not changed. I'm afraid the same question gets posed in Algeria and other countries um, as well. Uh, Burkina Faso today is being torn up, as is most of the Sahel region, Western Africa, uh, by the crisis that the capitalist system has imposed on the region and uh, by what's happening there. Just the rise of terrorist attacks by jihadist groups. But it's not just that. I mean, there are signs that former soldiers of Kampore's Comp army are also involved in, in this and that. And so there are se many provinces now, seven, eight, nine, they're under uh, um, states of emergency in Burkina Faso. In January, the president of Burkina Faso fired the entire cabinet because of the instability in the country. There are 100,000 children right now that cannot go to school because schools have been shut down because of these terrorist attacks and that. And uh, so this, if this had been true in Sankara's time, this would not be the case today. And I want to discuss that some. Um, but it, it, it's tearing up the region, and it's become the reason for imperialist forces from Washington to Paris to send in troops, and, and that, I mean, to, to the area there's uh, um, that going on. One of the things that struck me from meeting our friends from Burkina Faso was uh, the fact that Muslims and Christians would sit down together at the same table and it was never an issue. And, that, and I said, how come that is? I mean, there's, and they explained, we're Burkinabi first. This, I believe was a, is a legacy of the Burkinabi Revolution of Thomas Sankara. In fact, the country was re renamed Burkina Faso, Land of the Upright People by Sankara. And just as people responded to Sankara and Malcolm, Ups, Malcolm X by staying up straight or by having regained their dignity, that renaming of the country captured that. And so they were uh, building a, a nation. Uh, I want to talk more about Sankara, but before I do that, I want to talk about there's turmoil in this country, too. Um, for the capitalist two-party system in this country is going through a massive crisis. It's, reflect, it's an expression of what's been happening for several decades in this country, the, the offensive against the conditions of working people here, how wages, working conditions have gotten worse. Um, how the dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, morality of the capitalist system is degrading and dehumanizing people. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep crisis, and it's reflected, as I said, in the breakdown of the two-party system. 
It's a system that's rigged against working people. I mean, Malcolm X, I believe, captured it most when he explained that Democrats and Republicans are the, par are the it's like the fox and the wolf. They're the two parties of the capitalist system. They both come after you. And full disclosure, I'm a member of the Socialist Workers Party, and I campaign and talk about socialism and the working class and the road of working people in this country to transform this country and eventually take political power. Um, that's why Sankara interests us. And um, so people ask me, well, are you the kind of socialist that's this Ocasio-Cortez socialist? Are you a Bernie Sanders socialist? My answer is the Democratic Party, the two-party system, this is an imperialist setup. Democratic Party is an imperialist party. And like Malcolm X said, you can't, a chicken cannot lay a duck's egg. <laughs> That's true of the Democratic Party. So what kind of socialist, what kind of socialism are we talking about? Well, I think it's helpful actually to go to Thomas Sankara and see what he stood for, what he fought for, a political course. Communism, socialism is not an ideology that's imposed or a blueprint. It's a line of march of an oppressed class towards its own emancipation and freedom. That's true in Africa and it's true movement. And the degree that that's understood, that we live in a class society and and a divided world, and that that is the fundamental conflict that's involved, seeing that most clearly and leading it forward is what the challenge is. Um, I believe that's when, what Sankara did. Um, he came to power in Burkina Faso on August 4th, 1983. Um, before that, he was a young man, he joined the military, it was one of the places you can, um, uh, it, was a, it was a better place to go in terms of income and his family um, was a little bit better off than other families. But through the experience he wound up in Madagascar where there was a popular uprising that took place against the government there. It had a profound impact on him to see what the students and the oppressed and the exploited people of Madagascar did. He also met young people from France who were revolutionaries and radical minded, people who had read Marx, Engels, Lenin. And he started reading some of the books. Um, he learned about the May June events in France the, of 1968 when there was a popular uprising in France itself. And he not only learned from that, but he saw that what was involved here was a course of what to do with his life. And he looked for ways to take the side of the oppressed and exploited. And he even did this in the course of being in the army and trying different ways to find a road forward. Then through, there's, there's quite a history here that Burkina, Burkinabi revolution didn't happen overnight. It was a series of struggles over time. But then in uh, 1983, uh, Sankara was arrested by the regime at the time. Uh, and he was liberated by fellow uh, soldiers. And that precipitated a popular uprising, Burkina Faso. We're told by some people this was a military coup. This was a popular uprising. People knew who Sankara was, they knew what he stood for, and they responded to his freedom. And uh, that led to the establishment of a, a new government. Um, and that. Sankara made clear from the very beginning what he stood for and what the revolution would stand for. There was no secret about it. Um, and he did what Fidel Castro or Che Guevara did at the, using the platform of the United Nations to announce and explain what the Burkinabi Revolution was about. He said in 1984, he went to the United Nations, he said, I come to bring you fraternal greetings from a country whose seven 
million children, women and men, refuse to die from ignorance, hunger, and thirst any longer. And then he went on to explain, I make no claim to lay out any doctrines. I am neither a messiah nor a prophet. I possess no truth. My only aspiration is to speak on behalf of my people, to speak on behalf of the great disinherited people of the world, those who belong to the world so ironically christened the third world, and to state the reasons for our revolt. And he went on to explain um, the economic bondage of class society, the ecological devastation wreaked by imperialism and capitalism, um, social disintegration that was brought about by these social systems, racism and wars of conquest, and that. What, and throughout, as you get to know Sankara and read more by him, what marked him most of all was his confidence in ordinary human beings and the capacity of, of working people to transform themselves, as has been mentioned that we can become different people, that we can break out of the dog-eat-dog -dog morality and, and living of a, a capitalist society and build a new kind of society. He really believed what Fidel Castro explained and acted on this belief, that man is not an incorrigible little animal capable of advancing only if you feed him grass or tempt him with a carrot or whip him with a stick. He said, anybody who believes that and calls themselves a revolutionary is not really a revolutionary and will never be a socialist, never be a communist. He believes, Sankara believed, that the new society will not be built by technocrats or financial wizards or by politicians. It would be ordinary human beings, as I said, who would transform themselves in a struggle to build a new society, one based on solidarity and uh, that. As you read his speeches too, you'll understand that he stood out among African leaders in the sense that he did not reject um, Marxism, the ideas of Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, Lenin, and others, working class leaders, as, as being European ideas or not relevant to Africa. Um, in fact, he very much un understood what was involved in those ideas in terms of what I explained, a line of march towards emancipation and incorporated them into leading the Birkinabe revolution. He was an internationalist. Um, he, ex he said, we look at the American Revolution, we look at the French Revolution, we look at the Paris Commune, the Russian Revolution, we take what's pure from those revolutions and we apply them to our experience in Burkina Faso. And we are the heirs of the world's revolutions. Um, yeah. uh, Cuba, as it has been mentioned, he had special regard. View, viewed the Cuban Revolution as a sister brother revolution. He says, our two revolutions are not the same. The conditions are not the same either, but in terms of courage, determination, and the constant involvement of the people. He said, the people, always the people, what is done, Cuba provides the lessons. It's, it's with this perspective that Sankara approached the challenges in Burkina Faso and led revolutionaries in Burkina Faso. Among the first, most important things that was undertaken and approached was the question of the land in Burkina Faso and land reform and the fact that you had a country that was 80% peasant, heavily agriculture, but outside of Ouagadougou, it was subsistence agriculture and the poverty that, um, and to take steps to reverse the flow of wealth, not into Ouagadougou, 
but out of Wagadugu to affect the lives of the peasantry without improving the lives of 80 or more percent of the population, the revolution would not survive. It had to make progress, nor was the development of Burkina Faso possible. So they took a number of measures, and they benefited the whole population. Um, but it, it was a strate strategic question to draw the countryside into the revolution. Um, one of the things that he's most famous for is he cut the civil servants' wages. And he said, you have to contribute a month's salary to the projects we undertake to the revolution. He's really cutting back on the bloat of the state apparatus that had been built up in the, by the capitalist government and saying that this wealth had to go in another direction. And it had to go for the projects that would benefit the people most. They undertook a vaccination campaign to vaccinate over 2.5 million people. The World Health Organization, the United Nations, the experts said, that's not possible. You can't do that. How are you going to do that? That takes people. He says, we will do this, and we'll do it in a few months. And not only that, we won't just vaccinate the Burkinabi children, but we'll vaccinate children from Mali, Ivory Coast, anyone who's in Burkina Faso, everybody. We're going to treat the same. And they did it in a matter of weeks, actually. Meningitis, yellow fever, measles. That, that had an impact on a whole generation. And who benefited most, of course, were the working people of the country and those in the countryside. Literacy campaign to teach people how to read and write. Not just French, but in their native languages. Yeah. Uh, they undertook building a railroad, which they needed desperately to connect one end of the country to the other, which is if you didn't have that kind of transportation and infrastructure, the idea of getting crop, cotton, food to the city, to get things from the city back to the countryside, and to weld together the population, it would be impossible. It would be very difficult. So he said, we have to build the railroad. This is where the World Bank and some of the other big international imperialist agencies said, this is another case. You are totally out of your mind. This is not possible. And he said, we're going to do this, and we're going to do it with volunteer labor, and we're going to mobilize the population. And as Sankara did, as all the great revol revolutionary leaders like Fidel and Che and others, went to the population, explained what it was that needed to be done, how it was going to be done, and then appealed to people to mobilize and just a few weeks before his assassination, that railroad was almost, it had reached its destination, was almost complete. It was a gigantic accomplishment that food self-sufficiency, Sankara said, look at your plate, look at that food on that plate, and ask yourself where it comes from. And when you can answer that question that it doesn't come from Burkina Faso, you can begin to understand our relationship to imperialism, what imperialism does to us in terms of exploiting our country, and drove to for food self-sufficiency in the country. Cotton, big uh, product of Burkina Faso, and cotton would of course go outside the country and then would come back in a form of clothes, mm -hmm. and and Sankara says we can't continue that. Where w where will the income go for our development if that's the truth? So, clothing, Burkinabi clothing. There may be a couple of people here wearing some of it today. There's one hand. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Burkinabi designing and making their own clothing. But it had to do not with the clothing per se, but the relationship of independence of Burkina Faso, of the building up the resources of the country so that they can be self-sufficient in agriculture and then use that capital to begin the process of industrializing this country, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, fundamentally, Sankara explained, our goal here is a qualitative revolution, a qualitative transformation of, the, of minds, and that translates into a practical building of a new Burkinabi society. He says, the myth of getting rich through a dog-eat-dog -dog struggle based on what happens in the capitalist jungle has disappeared from Burkina forever. 
Our homeland has become one vast construction site where the criteria of morality, the concern for jo social justice, and respect for everyone's fundamental right to live and to enjoy a better and better existence are not just empty words, but find their material expression in our social activity, the social activity of each and every one of us. He said, the most important thing for us was transforming people's attitudes. Um, and as Aruna explained, that to seize our destiny and determine our own future. Well, in 1987, I just want to digress for one second. 1987, um, Sankara, Sankara was murdered. He was assassinated. And um, he was assassinated by forces. You can be sure that imperialism was involved in aggravating the difficulties, that there's indications forces from the Ivory Coast, but within the revolution itself, among revolutionaries, People like Blaise Compore turn against his comrade and others and uh, murder him. Well, um, I just want to tell you real quick where this book comes from and why this book is so important. Thomas Sankara Speaks and Thomas Sankara Parle. It's available in French, along with the book that Professor Samad showed you about women's emancipation and the African freedom struggle. Uh, the militant newspaper, which is a newspaper I help distribute and the Socialist Workers Party distributes, sent reporting teams to Burkina Faso to report on the revolution because the example that was being set, the experiences that were going through, that they were going through was so important to anybody that wants to consider a revolutionary road or wants to see what other road the working class has available to it to get the truth about it, because the imperialist press certainly was not getting out the truth. And we printed the speeches of Taman Sankara in the newspaper so people, working people could read them. In fact, we had a reporting team in Burkina Faso when Sankara was assassinated. That reporting team got his last speech on tape. As the speech about Che Guevara, you may kill a man, but you cannot kill his ideas. The only reason that's available is because one of the team turned on their tape recorder and started recording it, quite fortunately. And after he was killed, and since Pathfinder Press is a publishing house that uh, is so valuable in terms of the books that they produce and that we help distribute and get out all over the world and all over the United States, uh, volunteers, uh, who helped make these books possible. This is not a business. If it were a business, it would have gone out of business long ago. <laughs> this is a working class publishing house that is supported and organized by volunteers, by workers. The same kind of volunteer effort that went into any project in Burkina Faso that Sankara talked about. And within a short period of time after his death, this book came out the first edition of this book, in French and then in English. And then it was updated again in 2007. And because of the capacity to do it, it was our pledge that we took our responsibilities seriously and said, we will make sure that what Sankara said, you may kill a man but not his ideas, is a reality. Ideas don't just float out there. They require human beings to implement them and carry them out. And you need to know about them. Um, and that's what this book is all about. So for those who wanted to bury Sankara and hope that he would never be heard from again, um, it, it's not only is he a symbol, but he helps provide a guide of action, a course of political conduct, a program that we can learn from. And while the United States and Burkina Faso are two different countries. It's the same course that I believe we need to engage in and follow. Now, I want to say a couple last things about people often ask me, I've spoken at Professor Smod's class a couple of times at 
the borough of Manhattan Community College and other places. Louder? Okay. Um, they asked me, well, isn't there something Sankara could have done? Didn't he know that they were going to try to kill him? Well, what, what could have been done? Well, Sankara wasn't naive. Sankara was a revolutionary. Uh, he knew what was at stake, that what was involved here and what he was leading with the Burkinabi people, seven million other Sankaras, as he called them, is a life and death struggle. And uh, he looked to lead that forward. And it was clear in the fourth year of the revolution that there were differences that were becoming wider among the coalition that was the government, the National Council of the Revolution, I believe it was called. And he decided that he had to wage a public fight, a political fight, to keep the revolution on track. I believe he knew that it could cost him his life. But I also believe he knew that if he didn't wage this fight in the way that he did, by taking the course of the revolution to the masses and explaining, what is this revolution about? Why is it about you becoming the rulers of this country, not some small group or not me as an individual, Thomas Sankara, that, that all would be lost if it weren't led along those ways? And he led a political fight. In, in this book, if you look at the last three speeches, you get an idea for what was involved here. And um, I just want to tell you, you know, in the Council, the National Council of the Revolution, there were other political groups. There were groups that called themselves communist. Uh, some of them had looked at China and considered themselves Maoist. And that, and, uh, but there were differences. Um, and he decided essentially that he didn't have a party, that there needed to be a party of, of, of the exploited, a political party, not a vote-catching machine, a political party, a vanguard party, one that could organize uh, people to advance the course of the revolution so that if one falls, the revolution doesn't falter. And that this would require hard work to do this. And he outlined in those three speeches what he thought the problem was and what the challenges uh, would be and how, what, in his view, a revolutionary is. Um, he said, <laughs> one of the things he said is, he explained that the revolution can't be imposed on people. The revolution had to come from a commitment from the ordinary people. He said, a, the democratic and popular revolution needs a convinced people, not a conquered people. A convinced people, not a submissive people, passively enduring their fate. He said that under the pressures that the revolution had been under for four years by the imperialist powers and others, he said, we've known adversity, but it's under this adversity he says, even without in our own ranks, he says, erroneous ideas and practices have developed among the masses, among revolutionaries that have caused the revolution harm. And we have to combat these. He said, some people are getting tired and they're starting to look out just for themselves. He said, they're deserting the revolutionary struggle. They've abandoned an intransigent defense of the people's interests and they're looking for their own personal gain. When he said that publicly, people knew that was true because they had experienced it and seen it among some people in government and other forces. He explained too, he says, there is even a slander campaign going on against us, Sankara. He says, from not just from our traditional enemies, but from elements within the ranks of the revolution. Impatient people who are infected with dubious zeal and with a, who conduct themselves with a frenzy of schemers, with undisguised personal ambitions. And he went on in these speeches to explain that, he says, we can't go forward 
and achieve our goals without a vanguard organization that's able to guide the people in all its battles and all its fronts. And um, he said, we need to, what, he, he discussed, what is a revolutionary? He said, the revolutionaries are those who are at the forefront of building the dams that we need for irrigation in the country. They're at the forefront of the battle around agriculture and food self-sufficiently. Those who are self-sacrificing and see the peoples loyal to the exploited, to the peoples, to the toilers of Burkina Faso, and put those interests first. He said, that's what defines a revolutionary, not the label that's put on you or that you assume. He says, our revolution will be worthwhile only in looking back in looking around and in looking ahead, if we can say that the Burkinabi are, thanks to our revolution, a little happier. Drink. Because they have abundant, self-sufficient food, because they're in excellent health, because they have an education, because they have decent housing, because they are better dressed than that. Um, if, if we can't do this, we're not carrying forward the revolution. If we can't have the people sees their own destiny. He says, we'll just have a collection of people of some merit who call themselves revolutionaries. He says, really a bunch of mummies who represent nothing but a lifeless collection of decaying values, incapable of moving or driving forward, incapable of transforming the reality that we confront. Um, and he said, okay, we need unity for the revolution. But what kind of unity? It's not just unity, okay, let's all get together. He says, this won't be like a soccer match played by teams that may be brilliant, certainly outstanding, but that offer only a 90-minute show. <laughs> he said, unity has to be forced through struggle by people who set the example. That Who then will be a revolutionary? Revolutionary will be those who in action and practice, but also in consciousness, succeed in taking effective, indisputable, unquestionable positions in the course of our struggle, which is, a, which is a concrete one. It is the struggle, for example, to build the dams, the reservoirs. It is the battle for the railroad. It is the struggle to open the roads, to build the health clinics, to pass on some of what we've learned to our brothers. Um, that's where we'll find the revolutionaries at the forefront of the struggle of the revolution. Um, he says, if the revolution's about being imposed upon people, he said, there are not enough jails in this country. Burkina Faso itself as a country cannot be turned into a jail to contain the number of people you will have to arrest. He says, that's not what we're fighting for. And then he proposed something very concrete. There were, there were teachers who had been fired for going on strike. Imperialist forces, in other words, were trying to destabilize the revolution. There were others that were put in jail for counter-revolutionary activity. And he said, I want them released. And we're going to win them back to the revolution. I want these people released. We're going to win them back to the revolution. And for him, this was an element in the fight to advance the course of the revolution. And this is what we're going to do. That drove some of the opponents of Sankara crazy. Said, what are you talking about? These people should be arrested. They should be executed for being counter-revolutionary. And he's, he said, this is not how this revolution is going to move forward. I believe that difference led to his assassination. The fact that he led that fight to preserve the course of the revolution and was leading a fight to bring together people in one organization that believed in that course to have a revolutionary party in Burkina Faso. That's, um, people saw the handwriting on the wall and they knew what was coming, where this was going to go and they're trying to stop it. This is exactly what the Cubans did after the revolution, what Fidel Castro led bringing together revolutionaries. The fact that the Cuban Revolution has lasted this long, this many decades, is a testament to the cadre that Fidel Castro and the leaders of the Cuban Revolution pulled together in the Communist Party of Cuba. And I believe this was the course, the road that
Tama Sankara was on. I believe this is the course and the road that is needed in this country as well and every other country around the world to build these kinds of parties that will carry forward this kind of revolution among working people and the exploited. And I'll end there and we open the discussion and we can discuss this some more. Thank you, Peter, for trying to cover as much as you can Thomas Sankara legacy. You know, that's not easy. Believe me, you can spend the entire day. You cannot cover Sankara legacy. That's <laughs> so many, so many action. Sankara was a man of action, a visionary. You know, whether you like him or not, you have to agree that Sankara was a great patriot. Someone who really loved his country and he gave his life for his people. Uh, I remember, you know, uh, Sankara was, uh, at one point Sankara said, you know, he's like someone who's riding a bike. And he get to the mountain, he has only two options, whether to stop, you know, pedaling, or whether <laughs> to keep pedaling and move up. So he said he has only one option, he has, you know, he has to keep, you know, going forward. So I uh, thank you everyone, thank for your attention. I think we're going to open uh, you know, um, the discussion now. If you have any question, you wanna make any comment, you're welcome to do so. Thank you so much. Anyone who has a question in French, any comment in French also, you know, is welcome to do so. So you got to raise your hand, we have someone in the middle with the, uh, we can, you know, pass you the, the thing and you can ask your question or any comment if you have it. Okay. Um, do you have any, uh, you want to come in the front? You can come here. Thank you. Mm. Okay. No, there is someone in it. You can come if you want to. Yeah, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dauda Emil Wedrogo. I'm a journalist, and uh, uh, I'm proud uh, to be here. And uh, I say thank you for uh, everything uh, which you share with, uh, with us today about Thomas Sankara. And uh, I'm uh, also the coordinator of uh, Stand for Life and Liberty. Stand for Life and Liberty is uh, uh, an international movement uh, that uh, uh, who have the uh, uh, same fight like uh, you do because uh, uh, we fight uh, against uh, corruption around the world. We fight uh, against uh, 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 the imperialism and uh, 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 we are uh, uh, young people who uh, want to uh, to build a network for uh, uh, dignity, integrity around the world. And also, uh, we promote uh, development uh, by uh, uh, create uh, a project for young people around the world to have a young people who has conscientious, who have uh, uh, a new mind to uh, build Africa and to build ourselves, our development, okay? And uh, uh, our domains is uh, education and agriculture, uh, growing, human rights, and so on. And uh, uh, I invite everyone who have uh, the same fight to join uh, our movement. Uh, if you want to join the movement, it's easy. You can uh, just uh, text uh, uh, a message to the phone number that I want to give to you, 347-261-6698. Uh, I repeat, 347-261-6698. Just text STAND, S-T-A-N-D, and uh, uh, we're gonna register you. Okay, now about uh, uh, Thomas Sankara. I'm proud to be here and uh, I'm proud to wear this uh, clothes. That's called Faso Danfani. I'm coming from Burkina Faso. Thank you.
And uh, I'm proud to be uh, a member of uh, the people who come to the same country like Thomas Sankara because he's a great man for me. He's a prophet for me. And then, uh, now, I listen to the speech, what Thomas Sankara do for our country and for the world. Now, I asking myself, what we can do for Thomas Sankara today, in, uh, after 32 years uh, 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 after his killing? What each of us can do for Thomas Sankara? That's the most important thing we have to think about. And now, Thomas Sankara was, was a pragmatic people, okay? It was a people who don't not only talk, but he act when he talk. And now, by this forum, I want us to act, to do action for Thomas Sankara. We have, for example, uh, a petition that the people signed to claim justice for Thomas Sankara. After 32 years, we don't know what happened, who killed Thomas Sankara, why they killed him. We have to fight for that. I know you fight for that already, but we don't have to keep silent. If we keep silent, we are like a people who is in the side of the people who killed, who, who killed Thomas Sankara. And for that, I want not only to claim justice for Thomas Sankara, but to claim justice for every single leader who is killed around the world for his political reason. We have to stand for that. That's the very important thing that I want to share with you. We have here, the United uh, Nations seat is here on First Street and, uh, and First Avenue. We can build a petition, okay? All the movement who want to, to fight for the leader who is killed because of his political region, we have to build this petition. I don't want to be uh, uh, long because uh, we don't have enough time. And uh, since 1962, 22 leaders African leaders was killed. We were killed because of his political reason. We have to say no. Enough is enough. And uh, uh, I can sit. Uh, I can tell you about Thomas Sankara. You have uh, Patrice Lumumba. You have uh, uh, Anwar El Sadat of Egypt, and so on. Okay. Now we have to do that for Thomas Sankara and for all leaders who is uh, uh, in this who was a uh, victim of this uh, situation. Okay, to finish, I want uh, to share this uh, uh, word of Thomas Sankara with you. He said, the slave who is not capable of assuming his revolt does not deserve to be pity on his fate. This slave will answer alone of his misinformed misfortune if he deludes himself about the suspicion conditioned of a master who pretend to free him. Only the struggle frees. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Widrago. Try it in Pelon, eh? Merci beaucoup. Yeah, you have been a little long, but that's fine. Uh, in response to your uh, comment about uh, justice for Sankara, just for your knowledge, we have a movement called uh, International Movement for Justice for Sankara. And I think the, uh, the, the organization is located in Paris in French. I lead them back to one guy, you know, whose name is uh, Bruno Jaffrey. So uh, this movement, you know, is in collaboration with Sankara family. And, you know, recently we had an uh, agreement from um, our French government that they're going to release uh, everything concerns Thomas Sankara. Uh, you know, uh, during that, you know, a particular moment of our story. So thank you so much uh, for your comment. Anyone want to add something? Okay, any question? Abukar, yes, please. Uh, this man over there is one of my colleagues. You know, we work together, tightly together for many years now. Thank you for coming. 
And um, I think I have some comment for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, well, it's uh, heartwarming to see uh, so many people. Okay. It's heartwarming, as I was saying, to see so many people gathered first around the ideas of Thomas Sankara, but second, they cannot talk about Thomas Sankara without mentioning Burkina Faso. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Peter, for your contribution and all your efforts. I am Bukhari, Bukhari Salogo. I'm from Burkina Faso. And uh, well, for quite some years now, I've, we have been working together, more or less, about around the ideas of Thomas Sankara and uh, the ideas of, for workers' parties and everything regarding that. Well, today I will not be too long except for mentioning about justice. He said that uh, we have uh, a committee, international committee for justice about Sankara. And uh, well, I do appreciate that, but I think that uh, everyone here, I don't know you, I don't know everyone here, but I know that uh, maybe some of you still have uh, the possibility to push a little bit, for, uh, a little bit more for justice. Just uh, raise the question somewhere from where you are, because that's something this, that matters a lot for me and for the family. For me, uh, Sankara is already there. They killed Sankara. And uh, my hope, my deep hope is to have some Sankara in my lifetime, other Sankaras. But pushing for justice today will prevent those who killed Sankara not to kill those Sankaras. That's my concern. And this takes me to another level. Today, we, we see what is happening in Venezuela. We cannot talk about Sankara today without mentioning what is happening in Venezuela. A revolution is a revolution. What is happening in Venezuela is capitalist against socialism, against the people. They're trying to take the power from the people. And we are here. I don't know what we are doing exactly. But I think we should do more to help the people of Venezuela, not to be talking later like we're doing now about Sankara. That's all I have to say today. And thank you very much for everyone for supporting the fight and the struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci, Bukhari Salogo. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, you want to ask this question? Okay, Peter, please. No, Peter, want to ask uh, you know, the question and then we... Well, I think what Bukhari raised is very important about what's going on, what's going on today. Um, anybody, anyone that knows Sankara, anybody who, everyone needs to stand up today and speak out and get out the truth about what Washington, the government here in the United States, is doing in violation of sovereignty of the people of Venezuela and also of Cuba and the threats against Cuba. Um, this is an elementary responsibility and duty of anyone who claims to be a revolutionary in the United States of America to confront our government about what they're doing right now. So I think what Bukhari raised is very important. And to get out the truth uh, about what Washington is doing, there should be picket lines, actions, teachings, wherever we can have them to just get out what's, what's going on about this, and uh, I think you, you can pick up literature the front in the back about this, and anyways, I just wanted to add that. Now, a couple of things on, on justice for Sankara. I know there's been a real struggle by the family and by supporters of the family to get to the bottom of, and to bring to trial those who are responsible for the killing of Sankara. Uh, and it's taken a lot of time and effort. There are those as well who are looking to build a monument to Sankara. Um, in, in fact, the government in Burkina Faso just unveiled a statue, which a lot of people were upset about because it has not, <laughs> it doesn't look anything like Sankara and does no justice to his image. Um, but here's the thing. This government in Burkina Faso now is a, is a capitalist government. This is the same regime with a different face. 
This is a regime that in the fight against terrorism in Burkina Faso has an army that just has been responsible for killing and pulling people from their homes and executing people they claimed were terrorists. But Human Rights Watch has a whole, whole, whole story on this. Um, that to have them put up a statue for Sankara seems to me to be that they have blood on their hands. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the best memorial to Sankara, the best, best commemoration of Sankara's life is to carry out a course like Thomas Sankara, to, to carry out a revolution, to finish the work that he started, to build the kind of party that he was looking to build in Burkina Faso, but in the United States as well, to build the communist movement. Um, I believe that that's important. There's another thing that I wanted to raise. Um, there are many people from West Africa who've come to the United States and who live here now. There are people who've come from all around the world. This is the imperialist center of the world. So immigration from everywhere. The working class, in fact, in this country is being reinforced by this immigration. And um, working people in this country, and, and, and uh, we need to find ways to build solidarity and to see each other as part of the same struggle uh, in this country. So let me give you an example. In New York City, there are 100,000 drivers, Uber, Lyft, yellow cab drivers, green cab drivers, and that. These companies all compete each against each other, and they have these drivers at each other's throats competing to make a living. And it's very difficult to make, make a living. There's West Africans, there's Tibetans, there's from people from Nepal, from India, from Bangladesh. There's Caucasians from Eastern Europe, from Russia. That What needs to happen is we need to not just see ourselves at, as immigrants from different countries, but as part of one working class and to build solidarity. Can you imagine what would happen in this city? 100,000 drivers. In fact, it would be the lar it is the largest workforce in the city if it were considered a, a workforce by any one employer. Came together for one union and said, we're gonna fight for all drivers. Um, that, that's really what, that, that would be a course like Sankara's course under conditions here in New York City. And to refuse to subordinate our needs to those of any capitalist political party, whatever election they're going through, whatever they, but, but the fight to advance the interests of the working class. Anyway, just a couple of thoughts. That Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, um, yeah you can, you want to talk? Uh, my question was about Venezuela. Oh, okay. Are there parallels to be drawn in the time leading up to assassination and the current events in Venezuela now? I don't know. Uh, but what I can say about Venezuela is that Venezuela is uh, a particular. Can you, the can you repeat the question, please? No, can you repeat it? So the translation. Oh, okay. You said I uh, asked a question about. Can you repeat, please? For, uh, everyone. Uh, come up front. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So my question is, are there parallels to be drawn in the times leading up to the assassination of Sankara and the events currently unfolding in Venezuela? You know, it's important to understand uh, the relations so we can prevent something like that from happening in Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, anyone in the room? Yeah, I'd like to say too. Oh, yeah, please, thank you. Fortunately, I have never been in Burkina Faso, but I was in Grenada prior to that takeover by the U.S. And um, we saw many things. First, trying to divide the um, comrades. And um, second, trying to disrupt the economy so they could not send anything out and could not buy anything. 
So consequently, the prices of basic things went up sky high like Venezuela, and people could not afford to do basic things. They blamed the government, but the government was not the one that blocked the imports and stopped the and put um, embargo and called upon its allies in the region and in the world from buying things from tiny Grenada. They also sent 18 U.S. warships around Grenada, which is twice as big as Staten Island. And it was, uh, and the media was constantly coming in from neighboring countries, uh, trying to destabilize. So from what Venezuelans have told me, these things are all happening. Then they went to the uh, Grenada M uh, mission to the UN, took it over, put out the offices, um, collected all the equipment, materials, papers, etc., and put their own people, Grenadians, who they supported, who, who supported them in the office, as they've done in New York and tried to do in Washington to the Venezuelan embassy. So divide internally, and they, it was really difficult to live in Grenada because you couldn't find food that you could afford, or most people couldn't. Why? They grow most of their food. They send food to Trinidad and Venezuela. But now they were blockading them. So I hope that somebody who was in Burkina at the time can tell us, but I saw that myself in Grenada. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Shamas. Um, I think what, you know, the situation in Venezuela, um, I remember me, uh, the situation in Libya, look to a uh, similar, you know, uh, situation. Because in Libya also they started like that, you know, people was, you know, um, by the media, they use the media uh, to put the people against each other, saying that, you know, they need more freedom, more democratic, you know, um, uh, value in the, country, in the country. But in fact, those people have been manipulated and they use the media to divide the people. That was the same situation in Burkina. Before they killed Sankara, there was a lot of information going on. Sankara is the dictator. Sankara steals the people's money. Sankara doing this. Sankara doing this. And at what point you don't even know what the right information. What is this true? What is false? So that's the same thing we're going, you know, that's going on in Venezuela. So I think, you know, um, comparing to Burkina or in Libya, Libya, you know, Qaddafi has been killed. But comparing to uh, Venezuela, I think we are, um, 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 the President Maduro has a support from whether in Cuba, I don't know, in some way. But to Russia, Russia is, uh, you know, uh, officially said, you know, the support Maduro regime. And I think uh, that may be, uh, you know, a little, uh, um, you know, that may help him, you know, get over this situation. So, Peter, you want to say something? And Venezuela. Um, okay. Uh, what the working class in Venezuela needs right now is for imperialism to get off its back. They need to be able to discuss and decide how to carry forward a revolutionary process in Venezuela. Uh, Cuba's got its own revolutionary process and went through and expropriated the capitalist class. They went to Miami and they started building new society. The, there were different stages of that struggle that took place. It's one of the reasons they've been able to keep imperialism at bay for decades, because of the mobilization of the people. Venezuela hasn't even gotten to that point yet and there all sorts of questions of leadership that are involved. But you can have differences of opinion about what's going on in Venezuela, but you gotta have the fundamental thing right, which is 
Washington's got to get its boot off the neck of Venezuela and let the Venezuelan people decide what road forward and how to resolve those problems and challenges and how to advance the process there. Um, secondly, I don't think there's reason to be there's reason to be hopeful in the sense working people in this country now are more open to having this discussion about what the character of our government is in the United States. And I'm not talking about capitalist parties and stuff, but the fact that this is an imperialist government with two imperialist parties, two wings of the same bird, carry out the same policy in different ways, and that it's the same government that it fundamentally guards and defends the capitalist class in this country and their oppression and exploitation of working people here. And that we can go with confidence to working people all over the city, but not just in the city. I've been out to far out Long Island, to western New Jersey, to rural areas in, in, in different parts of New York, along with others in the Socialist Workers Party, going out to, to discuss socialism, to discuss politics, to discuss what's going on in this country and w why we need a revolutionary change here. I think people are more open to discussing these questions than they've ever been and are more willing to have the give and take that's possible. And we will find people who will be willing to be part of doing things together to oppose what the U.S. government's doing. Um, anyway. Hopefully there's others here who have <laughs> joined in the discussion on this. Yeah. Anyone want to add something about Venezuela? I think it's a very important question that we're discussing here. Because, you know, there are many, I've heard many people say, uh, well, discussing the question, well, why was, why was Sankara killed? Or what can we do to prevent things like that from happening again? Um, and on one level, the answer is, well, you, we, you, no revolution can, can prevent that for, for sure. You're in a revolutionary struggle. Uh, and, you know, there are all the vicissitudes of that struggle. Um, you know, Lenin. Lenin always didn't didn't be, he was he he didn't believe there was, he thought there was a very good chance he would be killed long before the victory of the Russian Revolution, the October Revolution. It was a, the vicissitudes of many things that you couldn't control. He survived. How many times did they try to kill F Fidel in the mountains and 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 in the, in the I mean everywhere. And then the, to say nothing of the 600 times that the CIA has tried to, tried to assassinate him from <laughs> after the, the victory of the revolution. As, as one of the, one, one of the uh, very important uh, revolutionary journalists in, uh, in, in Cuba said, Marta Rojas, who covered the, the initial trial uh, in, of uh, Fidel after the, uh, after the uh, assault on Moncada, and when, when Fidel died uh, two years ago, three years ago, uh, I happened to be in a meeting that she was in, and she said, you know, when I heard the news that Fidel had died, I said to myself, he won. <laughs> 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 After all of that, they never got him. They never got him. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so, but the, the, the important thing is, and, and I think uh, Peter pointed to this in the, in the uh, comments that he made at the end of what Sankara understood he was doing and was trying to do, especially in the, the, those last, uh, the, those, that last, uh, last period. He was trying to build a party, a political party, bringing together the forces that understood the course of the revolution and the, what had to be carried out by the convinced people, not, the, not a conquered people. Um, and mobilizing and organizing along that course. Um, but th these, th but it's one of the great lessons, I think, of the Burkina Faso whole revolutionary experience. And that we have been, we have learned many times before in other conditions, under revol other revolutions as well. If you don't 
have that party, if you haven't been building that party beforehand, so that you, there is a cotter, there is, that, that understands what you're doing, that, that, you know, that it doesn't depend on, simply on one individual. That, that one individual sometimes is decisive. There's absolutely no question. The, the Cuban Revolution would not have been the same exactly if Fidel had died in this. The, the, the October Revolution might, have, might, might not have been the, the same if, if Lenin had been assassinated on the German train that he took back to, to the Finland station. Um, but if you had, if, 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 but that, that's what was, there was nothing like that in Burkina Faso. There were people around F Sankara uh, in the in the military, especially that un, that he, that were on a that understood and that were in agreement, but it was that it was that, that he hadn't had time and they hadn't gone far enough to have that political party, so that no matter what happened to uh, Sankara or what had happened to Fidel, the revolution still could go forward. Uh, it might it was different. It would have taken different convert, all the rest. But it would not have died with him in the same way, um, and that is that's a very important lesson for us here, uh, for us here in, in in the struggles that we know are will come in the United States and must come, uh, at, because it's here in the United States more that the, the decisive struggles will be fought, not until we bring until U.S. imperialism is wiped off the face of this earth will any of us <laughs> have a secure future. Uh, in going forward, but I, I think this is this is important. This, 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 this piece of it is important, and everything that Sankara did, uh, you know, when he says we are heirs of the world's revolutions, and then he went on and he said not only its victories but its failures, its its terrible failures that have brought that brought such horrendous violations of human rights, uh, and, and the, the right, you know, referring without any ambiguity to what, the, what had happened in the Soviet Union uh, under Stalin and so forth. He says, we've learned from all of those things, and we take what is pure from these revolutions and what can help us move forward. Uh, and they, we absorb them, uh, and as, as, uh, as Peter referred, he said, these aren't, aren't European ideas. He was very explicit on it, and, and that's what made him unique, absolutely unique amongst the revolutionary leaders of the all of the anti-colonial struggles and, in, and national liberation struggles uh, in in, uh, in Africa in this recent period, because he understood that yes, the all those ideas were applicable to any revolutionary struggle, uh, and that educating the people of Burkina Faso and the world, especially because he spoke for, to the world, not just there, uh, that this would that on on this course, and that's what that's why th these books. Published by Pathfinder Press, mm -hmm. Thomas Sankara speaks. Thomas Can Sankara Par, mm -hmm. um, and I would say that you know our, our team of uh, translators here today, <laughs> who are doing this, amongst them are the comrades who were um, the, crucial in putting together the first collection of these speeches, Thomas Sankara Par, and publishing them in French so that they would that that legacy would be available to all, uh, and that you know having those th those books and the you know, the one on, on women's liberation struggle, we are heirs of the world's revolutions. That's something that all of us can use and build on. Thank you so much. Any other question? I think we had uh, enough now for Venezuela. So, uh, any other question? Among our translators is Michelle Perry, who is the editor and wrote the introduction, the author of the introduction to this book, Thomas Sankara Speaks, Thomas Sankara Parle. And he's trying to translate what I'm saying right now. <laughs> but just put up your hand, I think. Put up your hand, okay. He'll be, he'll be glad to talk to you after the meeting. And, tell you some of the challenges we had in putting this book together and how we overcame them.
really quick, what can we do to help you guys? I mean, um, it's a great organization, definitely inspiring. Uh, as a native from Burkina Faso, I've been here for a couple of years, academia, corporate America. It has been time where I uh, felt a little bit shame of telling the story of my country. For the most part, when people ask you, where are you coming from, Burkina Faso, they don't even know where is this country. They, they relate much more to dust, disease, uh, war, so many things, to the point that even trying to explain yourself, uh, tell them the location of the country, it gets emotional and you don't even know what to say. So I was at the barber shop, got the flyer, and decided to come over. And I'm so happy I made it through. And seeing people with different background and, and different classes uh, coming here and definitely uh, listening and, and trying to get a little bit of the country, the, the, the Tamasankara, it's really inspiring for me. And I can't just leave here without saying thank you to all of the people that have come and, and ask you what is anything we can do to sponsor, promote the idea, and, and, and keep on fighting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for one, help get out this book to as many people as possible. But also acquaint yourself with Pathfinder books in the back there. There are many books back there on different questions. And you'll find them as valuable as this book. And uh, there are books on speeches by Fidel Castro, books on the, on the struggle here in the United States on what's developing here and has developed here for the last uh, several decades and what the prospects are for a revolutionary struggle in the United States. Anyway, go through the whole thing back there, acquaint yourself with them and we can talk some more um, after the meeting as well. Hi, uh, Steve Clark. Like Peter, I'm a member of the <laughs> Socialist Workers Party. Uh, uh, Peter quoted um, the speech that Sankara gave when he was here at the United Nations, and he he started out and he said, I, "I come I come here not to bring a doctrine or a special set of ideas." And I think that's so important from the standpoint of the, the, the kind of, of, of party that Peter was describing that Sankara was trying to, to build because it wasn't, as, as, as Peter said, there were, there were umpteen uh, Burkina communist revolutionary liberation party, this, that, the other, they all thought the question, the question of building a party was bringing together all those people with bright ideas. Um, Sankara had a, a different perspective. He's, he, he said it's the people that have been leading the fight to build the dams, to plant the trees, to carry out the course of the revolution, and Combined with that, we need the lessons of all the revolutionary of all the revolutionary struggles. We need the experiences of of Marx, of Lenin, of the of the Cuban Revolution, uh, of of other of other revolutions of that of that sort. Um, I think the question of, of mobilizing, getting out in the streets right now to demand U.S. hands off Venezuela, U.S. hands off Cuba, is extraordinarily uh, uh, important to get that to get that pressure, because there's 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 a combination. The Grenada, Revo the Grenada Revolution was under tremendous imperialist. Pressure, but it was not overthrown by imperialism. It was an island of a, of a, of a little more than 100,000 people 
and imperialism had been trying in every way possible to undermine that revolution for five years. And it wasn't until a small group around Bernard Cord that had been trained in Stalinism overthrew that revolution because they, they thought they were the true Marxists. They had the, they had the doctrine. They had the truth. Against Bishop, Maurice Bishop, that was trying to build a revolution that was built and based on the working people of Grenada. A mass, a mass party but a mass party that recognized it needed the lessons of revolutionary struggles from around the world and over 150 years and more. It wasn't until that government and Bishop and others were overthrown and killed that imperialism six days later was finally able to, to uh, do what it had wanted to do invade that island and, and occupy it. There, there's, a, there's, there's a book of speeches by Maurice Bishop on the back table, and there's an article called The Second Assassination of Maurice Bishop. I think, I, think it's worth, I think it's worth reading. I think the lessons there and their relationship to what happened uh, in, uh, in Burkina are, are, are very important. And our responsibility in this country, and in, in, wherever we are, I know we... We have comrades here who are visiting from Burkina, going back to wherever you are, U.S. hands off Venezuela, U.S. hands off Cuba. That's the contribution that we can make to working people uh, in, in Venezuela and Cuba and around the world right now. We have to be out in the streets with our steins and our, and our, and our voices, and we have to be organizing and fighting. Thank you. Okay, yeah, please. Um, hi, my name is Amadou Jalou. I just wanna add a comment. Uh, I hope you hear me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me now? Is it good? Okay, yeah. I just want to mention this. Um, we need a lot of more uh, Thomas Sankara's in, in Africa. You know, like, can you imagine if we have a lot of them and one of the Thomas Sankara is being maybe eliminated, the rest of them will still remain alive. So that's the kind of mentality I think the youth need to understand in order to be able to bring the change. So in all the aspects in life, we need Thomas Hankaras. Thomas Hankaras that will literally like build new things, not only in politics, but in all the domains. So that's really important. And I most of the time see that the major problem is people are very inactive in Africa, like the youth. So we like to talk about the problems, but we're not here to support the real, um, the real solution for the problems. So like, we need to be a little more active in terms of, you know, like finding a way to, to, to change Africa. So that's <laughs> my contribution. Here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, um, Abdul Diallo. So thank you, everyone. I think uh, we uh, are at the end of the conference. We wanted to thank everyone. Thanks for being here. And, uh, you know, have a great uh, evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.